In the past, if I'm not careful about knowing myself, I hire the wrong person. I think you're crazy if your assistant only does work stuff for you. There's no right, there's no wrong, there's just a right for you and a wrong for you. So the first place to start is just to start with yourself. And it takes too much effort for you to sit down for 10 hours to go through all this stuff with them. Maui Mastermind presents the Business Coach Podcast, answering your questions and providing real actionable insights for building a better, stronger, more profitable business without sacrificing your time, life, or freedom anymore. Welcome to The Business Coach. In this episode, I'm going to take you inside a workshop that we did about how can we operationalize working smarter. Specifically, we're going to focus on how can you leverage a personal and or executive assistant such that you can create the time to do your business better, grow and scale it without sacrificing your family, your health, or your life to do that. Whether you have one assistant that's local to you, or you have three or four virtual assistants overseas, or you have a combination thereof, having that personal backup to you, the people can help to do that. That's what this is about. So here's what's going to happen. In this episode, what I did is I've asked Chris, our, our main video guy, to go back to our archives and to pull together three different clips from one training that I did um, with our business coaching clients. I'm letting you sit in on that training. Um, I hope you enjoy it. This first section that you're going to learn about is how do you think about finding the right assistant? And I want to share with you some of the most important insights from the last 25 years of working with about a dozen assistants on my end that I've learned to help you find a great assistant. Plus, I've given this advice and watched clients use this coaching clients so I've refined and honed and sanded down all the rough edges. I think you're going to like this first segment about how do you find the right assistant for you. Enjoy. How do you find the right assistant for you, turning to page three? The most important first step, step one it says, which is to know yourself. The first step of hiring a great assistant is not to find a great assistant. Because your great assistant might not be the great assistant for somebody else. Brad might find someone who's perfect for him and his um, accounting CPA practice. That might be very different than what Scott needs in over here in his evidence business, his, his uh, expert testimony business. They might be very different. Not just because the businesses, what would make them needing different assistance? Is it the businesses or is it something else? It's themselves, it's their personality styles. So what you're going to want to find out starting off with is start off by asking yourself, what personality are you, right? Are you an introvert or an extrovert? For example, outside of these events, I'm a very much of an introvert. When I'm at home in the office, I, I, all of our staff works remotely with one exception. So I work out of an office that's about a four and a half, five miles from my home in Jackson. And when Stephanie comes in, she comes in there typically on Mondays and on Wednesdays and spends anywhere from one to four hours on each of those days. And the rest of her work she does remotely. When she comes in, I'm not the most chit-chatty of people, right? I want to be focusing on getting work done so that I can go home and be with my family. I want to get home to play with my kids when they get home from school. I want to, that's what my focus is. So what I've learned is in the past, if I'm not careful about knowing myself, I hire the wrong person. I had an assistant about 20 years ago. Uh, actually closer to 17 years ago, excuse me. And she would come over and she kept saying, well, what's wrong? What do you mean, what's wrong? Well, you, you don't talk to me. I'm like, I pay you. <laughs> In her mind, me not talking to her meant that she was doing something wrong. By the way, that wasn't a problem with her. It was me. I hired the wrong person. For me, some of you would be the opposite. You hire an assistant who needs peace and quiet and you keep talking to them and they're like, I can never get anything done. You keep interrupting me, right? So knowing yourself, I'm an introvert. You might not be. I like a quiet workplace. I want to get my stuff done. I don't like drama. Some of you want excitement and hearing about somebody's wild weekend is exciting to you. I don't want to. Huh. I got enough drama going on trying to keep my kids in line and my relationship with my wife and trying to stay healthy and, and deal with all the other parts. Everyone is different, though, knowing yourself. So what's your personality style? Um, I tend to be fairly quiet and self-contained in the workplace outside of this. Somebody else might be really kind of, I won't call it rude, but just like, this is what I need. 
right? And just know it. If that's who you are and you can describe it to somebody else, they can make an adult choice if it's the right fit for them on their side. Um, what's your work style, for example? Information in versus... I'm a, audit, I'm a visual person in. I want to read information. I don't want to hear it. I don't want you to tell me. Why? Because I can read three to four times faster than I can hear it, and I can take notes on whatever you sent to me that way. I like that better. However, for an information out, for delegation, I'm the person who's going to go ahead and tell you about it by sending you an audio message. I like that better. I had a blinding flash of the obvious about 10 years ago when it came to assistance, which is make delegation easy for you. You should not be adapting to your assistant style. You should know your style before you ever interview anybody so that you can design the ad and also design the interview process to determine is this person someone who's compatible with your style. And most assistants can be fairly flexible, quite frankly. As long as they know in advance this is what you're needing, most good assistants can handle that Henry might want his stuff to, to come in auditorily. He might want a text for a delegation. Right? Or, or that Bree might want to go ahead and have meetings for delegation. I don't like meetings. Meetings, if I have to meet with somebody to hand off, it takes me a minimum of 10, 15 minutes. I can hand something off in 60 seconds. I like that better. There's no right, there's no wrong. There's just a right for you and a wrong for you. So it used to be that I would keep a whole list of stuff and then once a week I would meet with my assistant, they would record the delegation session and I would spend half an hour, 40 minutes going through thing after thing after thing. Nowadays, I'll grab a, an app, like some of you, who uses like WhatsApp? You can just do a quick audio message, say, you know, hey, um, Paula, can you please handle X and Y? You're done. You can even see if she's heard it, right? So I like that part. Now, again, I don't know what your style is, but you just need to think about it. How do you like getting information in? When you get emails back in that have information, do you want one email per topic, short, sweet, fast, or would you rather have one email that says items one through 17 in one email. Personally, I like one email, one through 17, numerated, numbered, so I can print it up, and as I'm pacing around my office, I want, on my little recorder, I can go ahead and say, I'm gonna comment about four items, on item three, and on item nine, and on item 12, 13, and 14. I like doing it that way. I don't know what it is for you. Who would prefer to get like the one, one sentence email about something and, and have one per topic? Okay, who would prefer to get one email that goes into depth but have it there? Some of you would prefer to see it on an app, an app to track it, like a sauna or something else. How many of you want them to give you an auditory update when you meet with them for them just to tell you what's going on? There's, there's no right or wrong with it. There's only a right or wrong for you. The number one cardinal mistake that people make that screws up their relationship with getting a good assistant and getting great value from that relationship is they haven't paused to ask themselves, what is it about me that I should know? You're not gonna change at this point about many things, and nor should you. What's your personality style? What's your information modality? All, that thing, all these questions that you see there. How do you tend to be? I tend to be very polite, but I tend to be, with my assistant, a little bit hands-offish. So if I need an assistant that needs lots of hand-holding, I'm the wrong person for them, and they're the wrong person for me. I tend to, to, to sketch things out. I need this, this, and this, and then they have to figure out the details. Yet at the same time, I tend to be anal retentive. <laughs> Surprise. Right? So when I go to travel, I, I want to know, like for example, when I, I was lovely, I checked in here, she did exactly what I needed, right? She put me on a particular area of the hotel. She made sure I was far away from ice makers and, and, and elevators, and she made sure that there was a refrigerator. Now it turns out that every room has refrigerators here, but if there wasn't, she'd make sure there's a refrigerator in the room so that I can get healthy food and store it in there so I eat better on a trip. Those are things that matter to me. When she confirms a room, I want in the appointment memo the first name of the person she spoke with, what date and time she spoke with them to confirm these things. Why? How many of you have ever been at the front desk of a hotel and they said, oh, we never knew about that request, Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so? I say, well, gosh, looks like Emily talked with um, Joni uh, on the 17th at 2.40 p.m. and she confirmed these things. Oh, right, it puts some accountability in there. I like that. You might say, that's ridiculous. Why would you ever want her to write all those things down? Again, it's what you want. So knowing what you like, what you enjoy, what you hate, like I'm not into idle chit-chat. If I have an assistant that wants to talk to me all the time in the, in the office place, it would drive me crazy. Drive me crazy. Others of you would find out, well, what's wrong? Is my assistant mad at me? He 
He never talks to me. She never talks to me. I don't know what you want. So the first place to start is just to start with yourself. So as we're going through here, how many of you can just start, how many of you have been making notes or jotting about things about your styles and preferences as we go? Before you get to the point of searching for who you need, stop and say, who am I? How am I in the workplace? And then ask, who do you need to match up with yourself and your preferences? I hope you picked up some great ideas about how you can find the right assistant for you. In this next clip from the workshop, you're going to be sitting in there with our business coaching clients as you hear about this idea that the most important thing you can do with a brand new assistant is to have him or her UBS systematize the role of being a world-class assistant for you. Let's join the workshop. Part of your assistant's job is to UBS the function of being a world-class assistant for you. UBS stands for Ultimate Business System. It's an acronym. It's been around the Maui community now for almost 20 years. Basically, it's you systematizing or building the system. The UBS stands for your master system of how you create and store and refine and access and restore and delete when needed different systems, right? How do you, how do you kind of have your system for creating your systems? Part of your assistant's job should be that he or she creates the documentation and the systems so that the day comes that they're not there anymore, somebody else can do that role starting further down the road than, than, than they were. So an example for that might be like this. This is the UBS I have in my assistant function. It's not perfect, but it's a good start. For example, there's information here about my calendar and recurring credit card charges and office and travel. Um, a training system of about uh, 12 or 15 training videos there. This is a screenshot I took a couple years ago. The one right now is a little bit more flesh, but every time somebody kind of comes through there, they make it a bit better. And I'm, I don't know if it's me or, or the world, but I've not had the experience of that one business owner who I mentioned to you before with a 30, $50 million a year company who had one assistant for the last 23 years, 24 years. That's not been my experience. I've had multiple assistants over the last 25 years. Um, I probably have had 14 or 15 different assistants over 23, 24 years. Some I've promoted into other roles in the company. Some have chosen to leave. Some I've asked to leave, depending on the person with that. Um, what I found for me is I need to make sure that part of their role in the interview process is, hey, you're going to be systematizing the role to be a great assistant, just like other people before you have to give you a running start. As we go through your onboard, when you notice things that are different or things that aren't covered, I'm going to ask for you to do the next version of those systems. And by the way, if you bring it up during the interview process, are they uncomfortable with that? Never. If you wait two years that they're in the role and then you go to them two years later and say, oh, by the way, could you start to systematize what you do? They freak out a little bit. Remember, these are security conscious people. So make it part of the interview process. I would make that you can ask questions, where have you created systems before? Here's the other beautiful part. When you bring on a new assistant, he or she is not very good at what they do for you for a while. And it takes too much effort for you to sit down for 10 hours, like in a week, to go through all this stuff with them. So as you onboard them, have them record the onboard. If you're really polished, they can record by video, but generally just audio record. And then they go back and listen to the record and make version 2.0 or version 1.0 of whatever you gave them of that training. It might take them for every one hour of onboard with them. It might take them three to five hours of back end. By the way, the output of those three to five hours is that useful for you to have good systems of what you train them on. Everyone go like this. So it's useful, valuable work that was easy for you to ask them to do during a time that it was not easy for them to do anything else of value. Plus, will they learn it slower or faster if they're documenting it as they go that way? They're going to learn it faster. They're going to learn it faster that way. So have them UBS right there as they get started with that. On the onboarding part with that, we'll go back to the, the, the iPad if we can, Chris. Um, we've got a whole big piece here that talks about what you need them to do. The simple part for it is, and, and I think this is important here, a lot of the onboard is going to be the same for every hire that you have. Company information, information about certain things. What's different for your assistant is you may or may not use them to leverage you in your personal life too. This is up to you. I think you're crazy if your assistant only does work stuff for you. I think you're crazy. Because 
the way I look at it is I, I have a certain inventory of hours outside of family or health or uh, marriage, things of that nature. And so if someone can save me three hours by taking my car in to get the winter tire, snow tires off and the, the, the normal tires back on my car and can sit there and wait while big O tires switches it out and saves me three hours, those three hours can either be used for enjoyment or used for creating value in the business in some way. I think that's a great use of an assistant's time. Now you have to decide if you're comfortable with that. So we now know that with your new assistant, you're gonna have him or her as part of their role is to continue to either document or UBS the role of being a great assistant for you. Or if you've already got that UBS, if you've already got that system, collection of systems to be a, a world-class assistant for you, they're gonna continue to add to, refine, pull away stuff that no longer applies so that at the end of their tenure, whether that be one year or 10 years or a full career, that the UBS for that is even better. In this final segment from the workshop, I want you to sit in as I share with our coaching clients, um, what are 10 specific UBSs to get started with with your new assistant? And I think you're gonna find that this list of 10 UBSs, 10 systems that you're gonna to need to go through with your personal assistant, your executive assistant, this new person, so that he or she gets to know how to produce value for you. I think you're gonna love it. Let's join the workshop. 10 things you should ask your assistant, the first assistant or the next assistant to create for you. The first one is we call this your key person list, your key person UBS, your key person UBS. And what does this mean? So in your business life or in your personal life, there are certain people that really matter. Who are the key people in the company that, that you're going to talk about or ask them to help with? Who are the key clients that they should know about? When so-and-so calls or emails, they're our number one client, get me, right? Or, hey, this vendor is perennially late. You've got to really stay on top of them. Or, you know, in our personal life, hey, here's who my, my, my family are. Here's the key friends that I have with that part. Um, here's school information if something happens with my kids that you notice from that part. Share that information in the list. And is that going to stay the same every time? No, it's going to have to be updated over time. Next one here, your business structure, business structure chart. How many of you own more than one, technically more than one entity? Right? Your assistant probably is going to help staff you across entities. And I can't tell you how confusing it is for you to say, you know, you've got, you've got Widgets Incorporated, who now does provides services over here for, for um, Acme Manufacturing, managed by Professional Management Inc. Just give them the lay of the land visually, or walk them through and do it on paper, and let them do the, the pretty PDF version of that part. If you've got an attorney who's done all of your estate planning and asset protection, your law firm probably has given you some kind of chart. You know, so you're going to want to consider that. It'll help them get up to speed sooner. So we call this your, your business structure chart. Again, are they going to share this with everybody else? No. We'll talk about confidentiality and expectations around that later. That's why I like to hire maturity. Oh, one more must-have for me is to never hire drama. How many of you have met people who are drama magnets? Just like literally life just happens to them about a hundred times more frequently than anybody else in the universe. Um, and I don't mean that, I'm not trying to be judgmental about it, it's just, I don't want to stand next to that person. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm sorry, I don't. What's your work style list, right? We call this your work style UBS. So my assistant can read on a sheet of paper that tells them, hey, I tend to be visual reader of information in. I want it via an email or through an app that we use. I want to auditorily delegate through this. Um, I, I'm very particular when it comes to things like travel and other appointments and how the structure with this is. But I often can be forgetful about dates and other things. So you need to remind me or not take it personally if I forget something. And don't be afraid of following up more than once. This is me telling them my work style. Next, do you have a, a UBS for your calendar? A calendar UBS. Now on the calendar UBS, here's a couple things that I find really useful with that. See if I can get to the right page with that part. I'll get to it in a moment. So on the calendar UBS, for example, do you want this person to manage any of your appointments? Do you want this person to 
make sure that in the appointment memo it always has who you're meeting with, where the location is, any of the pertinent recent emails or documents that need to be there right there so that if you're running late, you can just pull it up on your computer or on your phone right there as you go. I like that level of detail. If you, I, I've told Emily this, the thing that she does that creates the most value is every meeting that I have, having that appointment memo, and I'll share with you a picture of it in a little bit, having that appointment memo have the most recent emails that I've sent or received from that person, um, any of the key documents that we're going to discuss, if there was an agenda that went back and forth, that, that person's, you know, might be a link to their website. or So it's all right there. So that I tend to go from appointment to appointment to appointment very quickly. And she's not in the office, so she used to be 20 years ago, someone would hand me a folder that had the appointment information. Now, you can put right in the appointment memo with that part. And I find that works real well. So that's inside the calendar, right? It's UBS in our company for an assistant I work with. Number five says your file structure, UBS. Your file structure, UBS. Now I'm about to get a little bit geeky on you here, so bear with me here. We're gonna write something out. So if I were to make a, a post office address, I would say, for example, for Maui Mastermind, because in Jackson, somehow the US Postal Service cannot manage to, to actually deliver mail to a street address. It can only go to a post office box. UPS and FedEx have somehow solved this mystery but the Postal Service has not. 1597, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, 83001. Now you say, well, why am I putting your address? I'm not expecting a letter, although I'm lonely sometimes, and it would be nice. But on the other side, when you think about that, how do you read an address? Do you start here and go down, or how does the sorting happen? You start with what? Start with a zip code. So when I do a naming file, I might have it start with an NEF, have it an HD, an MM, an MMG, and the list goes on. These are the acronyms for the entities. New Edge Financial, HD Funding, Maui Mastermind, Maui Mastermind, the, the Success Summit Company, and I've got other entities. So she starts off always by storing the file, starts with the zip code. The zip code, in my case, is the entity. Okay, the next part, in the address here, it's going to start off with the state and the city. So for me, that might be things like, is it financially related? Financial, or is it content, or is it tax, or is it, and the list goes on with that part. But the second part is we've standardized probably about 20 different states from that part, and now the actual city, or excuse me, the actual street might be New Edge Financial, finan uh, New Edge Financial, Financial might be bank statement, from Acme Bank, June 2021. So when I look at it, I want to have, I want to be able to sort with these standardized filing ways so that if I, if I know what I'm looking for, I can usually s narrow the search by looking for these two things and it makes it much easier for fine stuff. What I discovered is when I had one assistant go to the next assistant, the first assistant stored it her way then the next assistant started off in her way, and before I knew that, five assistants later, I couldn't find anything from like six years worth of e-files. So now I've standardized it, and anyone coming in, we make sure that they get, this is how to store stuff. Because when you name files, you don't name them to make it easy to store, you name them so you make it easy for you to retrieve. Who thinks that's a smart idea? I get that that is anal retentive. Ten years from now, you'll thank me. Next week, you'll think that was ridiculous. But 10 years, you just wait. You just wait. Six, you need to have your acronym, UBS. What are, I mean, look at this. We already got NEF and HD and PP4 and QCH and RC2 and C3PO. And I mean, we've got all these acronyms going on here. How many of you use acronyms in your company? That's a trick question. Those that didn't raise your hand, I promise you, you also have acronyms. You just take it for granted that those are normal standard things. They're not. Everyone has them. So create that, right? Have a list for it. Make it easier for them. Next, sensitive information. Sensitive information, UBS, UBS. How do you want them to handle things like passwords? How do you want them to handle things like your files, bank statements, things that you give them access to. So now we're going to have a heart-to-heart. -heart. How do you handle sensitive information? Everyone is different. 
I'm going to give you what I found has worked well for me, you'll have to decide on your own comfort level. Number one, I hire maturity. If I hire someone who's mature, that's nine-tenths of the battle right there. Hire a good person. Number two, we have good contracts in place, which would include what? Confidentiality agreements on that part that are really clean and clear. Number three, I set the expectation, hey, I'm a private person. We live in a small community. I do not want you and you're agreeing not to share my stuff with anybody in the community. That includes your significant other. I don't want you talking with him about you know, bank stuff or, or other things that you're seeing at the workplace in terms of things that are personal information. I just, I, I'm private and I don't want that to get out in the community. It's uncomfortable for me. Are you willing to play by that rule? That if you were to share that, that's an out of bounds behavior. And generally those three things work the very best. Now we need to do some other stuff. How are they gonna access your files? For example, I, I have a laptop that I give to my assistant that's encrypted. Um, you might have them use their own stuff. Fair enough, it's up to you. We use cloud-based files as well. We use a password management program for our company, a separate, different one that's cloud-based for my stuff with my assistants. It has on there things like credit card information and the CVS code so that if Emily wants to buy me something that I've asked her to buy, she knows where the credit card information is kept and up to date. When my kids somehow con me or my wife to change the iTunes to let them have access to more media, um, it's all up there in one place with all that stuff, but it's kept separate from the company. Why do we keep it separate from the company? Because there's, I, I don't want the bleed from one to the other. I want to keep some distinction between that. I have one more password manager that's kept just locally on my desktop computer that I don't share. Guess what's on there? Banking access and things of that nature. Your assistant should not have any access to move, to move money for you. Uh, my assistant will run and does the mail runs from the P.O. box to take checks down and deposit, but she has no authority and no mechanism to take money out. That's important. That's a financial control for yourself. If there are checks in the office, you should have a check log that says what checks are in the office. If there are deposit slips, you should know what deposit slips, and they should be sequentially using those things with that part. Um, I think it's important for you to consider that if you're going to have cloud-based stuff, you should use really secure stuff for the financial information. I don't think you should be just doing it off of a Dropbox for financial information. It's too easy to screw that one up. So our company uses Ignite for our main file UBS system. Other people might use Dropbox. Other people might use Microsoft OneDrive. Some people, great. I use a separate, completely separate subscription program that's encrypted end-to-end -end both ways on the upload and on the download for the financial stuff between um, my local assistant in my office, Stephanie, my controller, Marilyn, and myself. And that's not that dissimilar. How many of you through your CPA or through your attorney have a quote, online vault, close quote. It's the same type of thing. It's got a higher level of encryption, both directions, upload and download for some of those things. So consider that. Um, I, I think it's important that you've had some real conversation with them about that. But again, the big three, hire well, confidentiality agreement, and actually an expectation and description of what out-of-bound behavior is. And just, just have an adult conversation up front. Who thinks that's pretty good stuff? Okay, next, travel UBS. I think you need to travel UBS, if you travel. I know the, you've traveled at least to here, but if you're only taking one trip every year, you probably don't need to worry about that one. But if you're, if you're going once a month or once every two or three months, you know, do you fly commercial or do you fly private? Do you, if you fly commercial, do you prefer in first class or in economy plus or in coach? Um, if you're flying in one, do you like aisle or do you like the, the, the window or do you like the, the joy and the cocooning of that middle seat? I don't know what it is for you. <laughs> what brands of hotel, what airlines preferences, where do you want? If you do a lot of travel and your assistant's gonna be the one staffing you for that travel and or the one arranging your travel, please, please make sure he or she has traveled before. <sighs> that seems obvious. I'm not even talking the Danya thing here, by the way. I'm talking about things like, well, they should know that if you're trying to get from concourse A to B in, uh, for example, let's say Chicago O'Hare, and you've got a 30-minute connection, there is no way you're going to make that unless you're like flash. I mean, it's just, it's impossible. It's too big of an airport. Um, they should know that when you're flying into Los Angeles, rather than going to LAX, sometimes it's nicer to go into Burbank, perhaps, if you have that option, especially if you're meeting in the northern part of LA or even further, further north than that, because Burbank Airport 
is so much less traffic as you go through the 210 on the way up to the north part. So they should get that kind of stuff. They should know things like when you book travel on a major site like a, tra like a Travelocity, these are places you lose travel rights versus when you look up stuff there and then go to the, the actual airline or the hotel direct to book. Right? You're looking for someone who kind of gets this stuff. Number nine, what's your household information? If you have somebody who does repairs for you or if you have a, somebody who does cleaning for you two, three times a week, just knowing that contact information can make it really easy. Hey, so-and-so, a package is going to come later today. When it comes in, if you can just pull it inside, I'll be by later today to, to pick it up for him. Right? Simple as that. Um, and then number 10, I think you really need to go through explicitly. What is your out-of-bounds behavior list? Those things like sharing of information or an email comes in and, they're, and they forward it to somebody else indiscriminately in a way that embarrasses you. If there's out-of-bounds behavior, you should explicitly talk with them about that. You should explicitly talk with them about that. Well, I hope you enjoyed sitting in on a portion of this two-day training that I did with our business coaching clients. You know, of that training, roughly two hours was on how do you find and leverage your personal assistant. You've just seen a piece of that. The other parts of that training, because I know some of you are going to be curious, how to do about how to operationalize working smart things like how do you use key performance indicators in your business? How can you get your team and your departments to think about their leading and the results indicators and other types of ways that you can upgrade your use of time? But what I'm hoping that I've inspired you to do and given you some concrete ideas on how to do it better is to leverage a personal assistant, whether that assistant is someone new to you or someone who might already be on your payroll. I wish you the very best of luck as you apply this because done right, your assistant is going to leverage time such that you can continue to grow and scale your company without having to give up everything else, without sacrificing family, health, or your life to do it. Good luck to you.